Let's just open with a prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak through your word, but you also speak through all things in our lives. I pray that we get to see also how you speak through creation. How you show that you have created the heavens. And I thank you for your revelation in nature and in, uh, in people around us. And I just pray that you open our eyes to see those things today. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a question, as I often do. And this is one of the most profound, most, what can we say, the, the question that all people through all time have struggled with. This is the question that we ponder, that we are trying to come to terms with, and that keeps us up at night. And it is, of course, which came first, the chicken? Or the egg. And uh, well, you might think I'm being silly, and I, and I am to some point, but it's also a serious question. The answer in the Christian world, at least, until uh, what was called the Enlightenment period and the development of evolutionary biology was that the chicken came first. But that has changed. Now it's held that the egg came first. And how that egg was fertilized, uh, nobody really wants to, to answer, but uh, I digress. The point is that I think the question boils down to this, namely, is there a God? And I think most of us here today, we believe in God, or at least we are open to the possibility that something divine exists. This is part of our series, Explore God. And, and last week, Paul shared about, is there a purpose? And it's hardly a question we can take lightly. I think this is something we all struggle with. Is there a God? And if you haven't, struggle with it, I'm pretty sure you will. I struggled a lot with it myself, when I was younger especially. The times I was uh, convinced he existed, times I was not so sure, and times I rejected him outright. And uh, something that you understand more and more as you grow older is that not everything stated with confidence is true. So today we will look at some arguments for and some arguments against the existence of God. And this will apply to theism in general. So it means those who, who believe in a God and not just the Christian God. So we're starting with a very uh, bright Proposition, God is dead. That's what Nietzsche declared in 1882. Now Nietzsche, he was an atheist, so he didn't really believe that God was dead, because God never existed, in his opinion. But his point was that God as a concept, we had killed, and there was no, no long, longer a need for the idea of God. And this sentiment is found in what we call scientism. Do you know what scientism is? It's the belief that everything can be explained with science. And it sounds very convincing if, if someone in a lab coat says it out confidently, but it's actually a, a rather weak position to hold because uh, uh, there are a number of things that science can't explain. And in this view, science is just elevated to the point of God. It's held in higher regard than anything else. It, 
science becomes the supreme. So how can we how can we challenge it then? Well, logic and mathematical truths, they cannot be explained by science. Did you know that? Science assumes that math and logic exists and presupposes it. Science cannot work without it. So you cannot, you cannot argue for science without them, and so you're going in a circle. Aesthetic judgments, such as uh, beauty and good, cannot be proved by science. Am I more beautiful than my wife? No, but uh, science couldn't tell you. Ethical value judgments cannot be proven by science. For example, science can build a nuclear bomb, but science cannot tell whether it's right to use it. And so Nietzsche himself, he realized that the problem with his philosophy was that it would inevitably lead to nihilism, an apathetic, purposeless existence. And I think Richard Dawkins, the famous atheistic evolutionary biologist, he sums it up very correctly the bleak prospect of life without God. He says, there is at the bottom no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. This is how Dawkins envisions the human life liberated from the oppressive power of religion. Anyone find that vision uplifting? No. <laughs> now count me out. Now this sounds so dystopian that I think Voltaire got it right when he said, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. And of course, as it turns out, God wasn't the one who died, rather Nietzsche was. So if God is not dead, Are there some compelling arguments for his existence? Well, because we who like to call ourselves modern people, we don't accept anything unless there's evidence, right? It has to be a peer-reviewed article until we accept something. But the question we need to ask ourselves, and, and the reason we are doing this also, is that some of these arguments uh, we don't know really well. Some of them it's good to know, and it's good to have something to give back to someone who is giving us truth statements rather confidently. And if you can post something or give them something back, for example, what kind of evidence will you accept? If I was to prove to you that God existed, would you accept the evidence? Pascal said that the evidence for God's existence and his gift is more than compelling, but those who insist that they have no need of him or it will always find ways to discount the offer. I think that's important to remember when you're engaging with family, friends, or anyone else out there in the world about the existence of God. So the first argument we're going to look at is called the cosmological argument. We live in a material space-time continuum, which we call... Nobody knows where we live? The universe. The universe. And it's dependent on the existence of all these three dimensions. Matter must exist in space, right? As where would you where we put it? And uh, it needs to exist in time, because else, uh, when would you put it? So all these three things need to exist at the same time. And uh, one of the famous logical arguments is this cosmological argument, and it goes like this. Everything that begins to exist has 
to cause. The universe began to exist, and therefore, if these two arguments are true, then it logically follows that the universe had a cause. And this is, a, is actually a very good argument for the existence of God, because science tells us that in the beginning there was nothing. And that's a rather unscientific proposition to hold, that nothing created everything. This popular definition of nothing, I found, it's uh, nothing is that which rocks dream of. Let that sink in for a while. <laughs> and it's apparently attributed to Aristotle, but I couldn't find that to be the case. But no matter who said it, it's a pretty good definition. Unfortunately, it has rocks in it, which is not nothing. But ironically, scientists who understand that this is not a good proposition to argue that nothing created everything, they now working on redefining nothing into something. And so now they're talking about parallel universes, and apparently there's supposed to be billions of universes just like ours. Uh, but if that's the case, then, um, then I would say you, you lost me. I mean, if you're claiming there are billions of universes, I do not have enough faith to become an atheist. And even the word universe, it's Latin, comes from unus, meaning one, and versus, supposedly meaning to turn back, but it also means one verse. And uh, unus versus. And isn't it fascinating also then that the universe was created in one verse? In the beginning, there you have time, God created, there you have the cause, the heavens, that space, and the earth, that's map. In Uno's verses, the first verse of the Bible, God caused the universe to come into existence. And it's perfectly in line with science. Another argument is the watchmaker argument, the design argument. Now consider my watch. It looks very expensive, it isn't. That's why I bought it. But we all know instantly that it was designed, right? Because it doesn't even cross our minds that nobody made this watch, that I just went out in the woods and I found it. We know that it didn't just self-assemble over millions of years, right? Because we, we understand that's, that's just impossible. Even if I took all, if I had all the pieces and I put them in a box and it was just continually turning around for millions of years, it would never turn into this. So why is it that when we see trees and flowers and birds and bees, and babies, cats, the complexity of the human eye, it has 126 million receptor cells that enables us to distinguish between 10 million colors. So when we see this, this enormous complexity, that has designed so clearly, how, how is it that some people refuse to grant that it's designed? And uh, Richard Dawkins' response to the design argument is, well, if God created the universe, who created God? And, and that's, that's, just, that's just baffling because it's, so, it's such a weak argument. He might be good in biology, but his philosophical standpoints are very weak. I mean, I wouldn't insist that there was no design of this watch unless you told me where to find him, or you could show me that 
that he was created. And let's just seal it to home. Yeah. Whether this, the design still exists or not, I know it was designed. Watson and Crick, these are two uh, British scientists, and they, uh, when they discovered the helical structure of DNA, this was in 1953, they proudly announced, God, no, there is no God. And much to their dismay, I think, it has since been shown that, like Bill Gates said, not a believer, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Now he knows a thing or two about computer programming. He has created the most advanced of them. And even Dawkins himself admits that the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. So if that's the case, what should be the logical conclusion? If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, Perhaps it is a duck. We know that computer programs don't write themselves. It's just impossible. It's highly sophisticated and ordered information. It requires a language and a mechanism for interpreting. It requires a mind. And so this DNA code, which is fascinating, in itself, it's found in every single one of our cells in the body. And if you printed it out on paper, it's three billion characters. So that means if you, if you print it on an A4 sheet of paper, covered in letters, and you stack the papers, it would reach over 90 meters up in the air. Wow. That's in one cell. So the complexity just boggles the mind. I think the psalmist sums it up pretty well in Psalm 8 when he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? But what about the theory of evolution? Isn't that the argument that always wins? Have you ever heard someone confidently claim that the fossil record shows us beyond any doubt that evolution is true? What is it? Evidence needs interpretation. And the fact that we find fossils is proof of an animal that died and was fossilized. Nothing more. It doesn't come with a age tag. This one died in this and this year. It doesn't even tell you if this animal had offspring or not. It's a framework for interpreting those fossils. That's what the theory is. And no matter what is found, it needs to be interpreted into this framework of Millions, millions of years. You know, now you understand that I'm revealing my, my view on the age of the universe. And uh, what can be good to know if you're a Christian is that there are different views on how old the universe is. Some hold that the, age, the earth is old. I hold that it is young, that means in, in the thousands of years. But, but most at least contend that macroevolution, which means that one kind of animal turned into another kind, is not true. So for example, a chimpanzee cannot turn into a human. And uh, even if we differ, I mean, I, I, I used to be an old earth, proponents, because I grew up in that kind of environment. Then I took a hard look at the evidence and I no longer 
believe that to be the case. I believe the earth is young. I believe the evidence point to that. And so I'm not saying that to that that you are necessarily wrong for believing in an old earth. Or many Christians do, but of course you are terribly, terribly confused. So, because uh, what happens then when people start finding soft tissue with red blood cells intact in dinosaur fossils? Did you know that? For the medical students, how long can soft tissue survive? How long? Two weeks? How about 65 million years? <laughs> Soft tissue from dinosaurs have been found in hundreds of places around the world. Did you know that? You may want to look it up. It's pretty interesting. How about the horseshoe crab? Which is not actually a crab, it looks like a crab, but it's, uh, it's fossilized, you can find lots of fossils of it. And it has apparently it hasn't developed in 250 million years because it's exactly the same today. Wow. It's still alive today. And you can see pictures of fossils and you can see pictures of the living ones, exactly the same. You know, so but unfortunately, those who believe in evolution, because it is a belief, will frequently use ridicule to all those who hold to a more traditional view of things. Uh, mocking is very much used. If you say that we came from Adam and Eve, that's cause to, to laugh at people. And ridicule is an effective weapon. Yeah. I think that many Christians even have left the faith because of it. Yeah. Um, because of this overconfident scientism and ridicule of the biblical position. That was part of the reason why I left Christianity for some years, when I left God. I couldn't square it with my faith. But if you need to ridicule someone, it shows that your position is actually weak. If you, if you cannot even take a question and handle it seriously. Not only that, but of course the theory of evolution also has Adam and Eve. They need to have, just further back in the line. And uh, actually it even posits that your great, 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 great grandfather and mother was a rock. <laughs> That's the theory of evolution. Now, if you study the growth rate of humanity since the days of Noah, because if we believe in the biblical position, then we would all have to come from Noah, right? Eight people. And if you look at the growth rate of humanity, it fits really well. It gives a growth rate of around 2.3 to 2.5 children per uh, family, which is not uncommon. So uh, I wouldn't count out the biblical position quite yet. John Phillips writes, The Bible makes no apology for introducing God into the nature of things. The theory of evolution, which leaves God out of everything, is not so much a science as a propaganda offensive, a convenient tool in the hands of the atheists, the communists and humanists for postulating a universe without God. That's why the theory of evolution is so popular gives the unbeliever a working hypothesis for atheism. He can, at least to his own satisfaction, explain the universe without including God. Either the humanistic scientist is right, or the Holy Spirit is right. The believer would rather trust the Holy Spirit than some man's ever-changing views. And these days there are even atheist uh, scientists that really object to their theory of evolution. Mathematician uh, David Berlinski, for example, he uh, objects to it, saying that not enough seconds have passed since the dawn of time to allow for anything even remotely close to what we see to have happened. 
And so it seems to me that uh, secular scientists are not so much interested in the science as they are in proving that God does not exist. Why? Because if there is no God, then it follows that you don't have to meet God. There is no accountability. There is no judgment. You are free to live as you want. And you can continue with the sin that you love so much. As Dostoevsky wrote, if God does not exist, then everything is permitted. And that leads to the moral argument. This is a very powerful argument, in my opinion. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist, and therefore God exists. What does that mean? Today many will say that objective moral values and duties do not exist. It's a matter of opinion. It's what you are taught as a child and what society uh, puts on you as you, as you uh, go about your life. What is true for you is not necessarily true for me. Isn't that the postmodern expression? But think about the implications. It means that you need to defend that the Holocaust was not objectively wrong, because there is no such thing as objective morality. Or premeditated murder is not wrong. Or rape is not wrong. Maybe you think it's wrong, but the other person doesn't think it's wrong. Who are you to judge that person? The basis for the Nuremberg trials of the Nazis, whose defense was often, I just did my job, I followed the orders, they told me to do this, and I did it. Well, that was not a good enough excuse. Because we judged those people severely. Because the government is not the standard for good and evil. If the government tells you to do evil, you ought not to obey. Paul wrote that when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, the conscious conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts ultimately accusing or else defending them. The law is written on our hearts, the moral law. Perhaps it's even in our DNA. You don't know. Because we barely understand 2% of the human DNA. But we have no excuse for doing evil, says Paul. Even the one who hasn't heard the gospel. Because our conscience accuses or defends us according to that law. So, of course, I'm very confident up here because I've studied and I've chosen the arguments that I, I wanted to present to you. Does that mean that I think it's easy to believe that God exists? Or that it's easily proved? No, it doesn't. I think that there are some really difficult things for us to deal with as theists. And, uh, Perhaps the most difficult one is the existence of evil and suffering. But that's the topic of a later sermon in this series. I'm going to give you one last, one last argument that I like, and it's given to us by C.S. Lewis. And you all know who he is. Uh, uh, I take uh, the atheist author turned Christian 
And he developed an argument in his many of his books for the existence of God for the argument from joy. And it goes like this creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger, food can satisfy. A duckling wants to swim, water fills its need. Men and women feel sexual desire. Sexual intercourse fulfills that desire. If I find myself with a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, I was probably made for another world. If no earthly pleasures satisfy the need, it does not mean the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it. So this object of our longing, this other world that we all have, even the atheist experiences this. We can't really define it, and we can't obtain it in this life, can we? But the mere presence of this desire that we have in our souls is felt to be more precious and more joyful than any other satisfaction. We think that this will finally give us the satisfaction that we crave. However inadequate really, and inadequately we express this, what we long for is paradise, it's heaven, right? it's eternity. So the question of whether God exists is immensely important. Whether you believe in God or not, it's important because it changes everything. It ties into the purpose of why we are here. You know, I can analyze every aspect of my watch. I can run all kinds of tests on it, all kinds of experiments. But no matter the test I do and the analysis I do, I cannot discover the purpose for why this watch was made. Only the watchmaker can tell me. I can make assumptions, but only if I ask the watchmaker can he tell me why it was made. If he's still alive. And in the same way, science can help us analyze every corner of the universe and can be of immense utility to us and can create positive things. But no amount of analysis can reveal the purpose for why the universe was made. Only the Creator knows. And the only way to discover that is to get to know Him and learn about what He has revealed about His creation. The good news is that He's still alive because God still exists. So is there a God? Yes, I certainly believe so. And I think there is plenty of good reason for you to do the same. I found this verse in 1 Timothy to be very enlightening. He alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor can anyone see him. But to him be the honour and eternal dominion. Amen.